You know, our one rule, first rule anyway, is one fool at a time. And we'll need that rule tonight because we do not have a microphone. And it's so, being looked at by a friend of mine right now just to serve some upgrades. That means that All right. Uh, without any further ado, then I think having all our announcements, uh, we will proceed to hear from Dennis Nelson. <laughs> Thanks for coming this cold Saturday evening. Well, I'm excited. I don't know if you are. This is the issue of the evening, the issue of the hour. I don't know if you've been, you've been following what's going on this past week. On Monday, the um, Southern Illinoisan group against fracking our environment called SAFE filed a lawsuit against the state government uh, to hopefully to overturn our lousy fracking rules. Uh, number two is on Tuesday, China and U.S. now have a uh, climate agreement, and we can discuss that a lot. The third is, uh, of course, you know, the Republicans took uh, both the Senate now as well as the House in the midterm elections. One of the things that they are attempting to push through is KXL, the Keystone XL Pipeline. And the vote comes up in the Senate this Tuesday, and I spend a, a good percentage of my two-hour time at the Herald Washington Center's computers doing some action alerts to our two senators. So I'm going to encourage you to do that. And actually, a lot of this stuff is not mentioned hardly at all in the presentation. It was already done. So uh, ask questions about it. We have plenty to talk about. Okay, let's get started. My background, experience, and credentials. I'm one of the original, mo original modern environmental energy conservation resource population activists ever since around the very first Earth Day celebration Wednesday, 22nd, 1970. I have a Bachelor of Science, BS degree in Biology and Environmental Studies from Dana College, Blair, Nebraska. I'm the Vice President of Chicago-based Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS, Illinois Nuclear Power Watchdog Group. NEIS has an ongoing educational campaign entitled, You Cannot New Climate Disruption, and promotes a technically and economically feasible carbon-free, nuclear-free energy pathway within 30 to 50 years. Introduction, why am I doing this presentation? I use climate disruption or disruptive climate change rather than global warming and merely climate change. This is because my messaging is still accurate yet more dramatic and better refers to what the adverse consequences are unless we take the necessary steps now to deal with it. Human-caused climate disruption is probably the most defining issue of our time in defining what kind of society and world we're going to have and defining how we're going to live. On Saturday, uh, September 27th of this year, a climate denier and delayer by the name of David Ramsey Steele did what I consider to be one of the most outrageous presentations ever given here at the College of Complexes. It was a co compilation of one climate denier, delayer, propaganda tactic after another. I thank the college, in particular uh, Tim Bolger, for giving me a couple extra minutes of time uh, for rebuttal. And I usually do one major presentation here each year. However, I'm here this evening because David's presentation uh, deserves a full rebuttal presentation. This is way too important an issue, and this presentation could not be better timed, as I said in my introduction. So here we go. My presentation has three major purposes. Number one, to expose the underlying contrived campaign to deliberately mislead us and to create doubt, confusion, and inaction. Number two, to refute the myths and junk science of the climate deniers, delayers. Number three, to discuss what policy initiatives we should and should not be taking. Uh, this is where we should be right now as a society and a world. David's presentation pertained entirely to point number two. 
My rebuttal pertained to uh, number one mainly, and three uh, some. And that's included, I thought maybe there'd be copies of it, but if you go online, I have a recommended reading list and also Appendix A, which is my a rebuttal to David's presentation on September 27th. Okay, let's consider an analogy. My late father owned a construction company and built one of the houses that my family lived in when, when I was a kid. Our home was constructed on a solid foundation. Now, somebody like David can honestly believe in what he's saying and doing. Any climate denier, delayer can do that. But if your foundation is to basis is totally yeah, crap, of what's that going to do to your belief structure, regardless your case is going to crumble, but you have to ask the question, what are the consequences to our society and the rest of the world? A brief climate history lesson, the Cold War roots of climate disruption. Oceanographer Roger Rivera, the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California design La Hala, it's, it's as in, as in uh, French, as in, uh, as in uh, uh, French or whatever, okay. Design an atmospheric monitoring uh, program for the 1957-58 International Geophysical Year, IGY, hired in 1956, chemist Charles David Keeling was put in charge by Rivera of this new IGY atmospheric monitoring system. Uh, Keeling constructed carbon dioxide monitoring stations at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii and at a research post in Antarctica in order to establish a baseline of atmospheric carbon dioxide which might be used to measure future changes. During March 1958, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was around 315 uh, parts per million. For an extremely important comparison, let's fast forward to May of last year when the level of atmospheric carbon dioxide reached 400 parts per million and is still increasing. And that is a reason to sound the climate alarm. In the annals of climate history, here is Roger Rivera's famous grand experiment statement made in 1957. Quote, human beings are now carrying on out a large-scale geophysical experiment of a kind that could not have happened in the past nor could be reproduced in the future. Within centuries, we are returning to the atmosphere and oceans the concentrated organic carbon stored in sedimentary rocks over hundreds of millions of years. This experiment, if adequately documented, may yield far-reaching insight into the processes determining weather and climate, unquote. Rivera's uh, statement has been quoted as a starting point for the concern by scientists about climate disruption. During the 1980s, in the uh, years of the Reagan administration, the ongoing efforts of astronomer Carl Sagan, biologist Paul Ehrlich, and climatologist Stephen Schneider to maneuver the science of nuclear winter into our national defense policy did have a great effect upon the politics of climate disruption. In response to this campaign, Long-time uh, Republican science administrators like Robert Jastrow and S. Fred Singer, along with one-time National Academy of Science President Frederick Seitz and scientists associated with the defense industry, formed the pro-hawkish, anti-governmental regulation George C. Marshall Institute, uh, being a right-wing think tank initially aimed at supporting Ronald Reagan's strategic defense initiative, Star Wars Fantasy, and the nuclear power failure, that's a little play on words if you get it, uh, the George C. Marshall Institute soon became a vocal oh. opponent of efforts to curb ozone pollution, depletion, acid rain, and climate disruption. So ladies and gentlemen, here we have the rise of the emergence of doubt. Let's continue with a modified summary that I use in my action alerts from a chapter in Donald Aero Prothero's excellent book entitled Reality Check, How Science Deniers Threaten Our Future. Donald R. Prothero is Emeritus Professor of Geology at Occidental College and lecturer in Geobiology at the California Institute of Technology. To make things perfectly clear, there is no actual scientific debate over the reality of human-caused climate disruption. Around 98% of the scientists who actually do climate research agree about human-made disruptive climate change. Quote, every major scientific organization in the world has endorsed the idea of anthropogenic uh, 
climate change as well, unquote. <coughs> the only debate is a political one, which is, quote, largely polarized along party and cultural lines, with the right-wing media and their followers uniformly opposed and critical, and the rest of the developed world uh, largely accepting the scientific evidence, unquote. Quote, although some reefs like the Great Barrier Reef of uh, uh, Australia are also suffering from problems like out-of-control predation by the Cronothorn Sea Star, the worldwide bleaching and dying of coral reefs can only be attributed to a global oceanographic change and only ocean warming and acidification fits that description." Unquote. Our space satellites have measured cooling in the stratosphere, the upper atmospheric layer, layer above six miles, and warming in the troposphere, the bottom atmospheric layer below six miles, just as the uh, computer models from the climate scientists have projected and proving that it is due to our climate disrupting pollution, not solar radiation. In fact, solar heat has been decreasing since 1940. There are no measurable increases in cosmic radiation, natural methane, volcanic <laughs> gases, or any other potential cause. We have the irrefutable carbon, the human carbon fingerprint smoking gun. The, the decreased ratio of the nucleotides carbon-13, C-13, to carbon-12, C-12 in the atmosphere is coming directly from our inefficient uh, combustion of fossil fuels. One to deliberately cloud, pun intended, <laughs> or confuse the issue, the climate deniers, delayers, have been feeding us lies, distortions, and misstatements to the general public. Uh, for instance, in, in 2012, leaked documents showed that the Chicago-based Heartland Institute, quote, a libertarian think tank and the major sponsor of denialist propaganda and phony scientific meetings, planned to try to get schools to teach its propaganda instead of the science of climate change, unquote. Let's, dis let's diffuse the myth of the 1970s global cooling scientific consensus. When climate science was developing during the 1970s, a few scientists suggested that the most dangerous form of human-caused climate disruption might come not from warming caused by carbon dioxide, but from scenarios that could send the thermometer mercury uh, going the other way. The climate deniers and delayers often deliberately misuse this early uncertainty as so-called evidence that the climate scientists are playing chicken little, you know, bok, 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 the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and claiming that this is uh, based upon uncertain or insufficient evidence. Despite the overwhelming findings to the contrary since then, the climate deniers, delayers are still claiming that there is a so-called big debate over the global cooling theory. Actually, there is not. So let's expose the myth of the 1970s global cooling scientific consensus. Only a few scientists supported the that idea as a whole, climate scientists never subscribe to it. Let's diffuse the myth of so-called climate gate, more correctly called hacker gate. Now David didn't mention this on September 27th, and nobody uh, brought it up. And I'm going to diffuse this myth because it's constantly repeated by the climate deniers and delayers in other places and circumstances, no matter how many times it's responded to and refuted. On, on November 14, 2009, a backup server at the Clim Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia in Great Britain was hacked into. Thousands of emails involving dozens of climate scientists were stolen. Uh, single words and phrases were taken out of context. The word trick is techno slang, that's my word, techno slang, for a clever and legitimate technique to solve a problem. The phrase, high to decline, is more techno slang referring to legitimately reconstructing temperatures. Now all the nine independent investigations from uh, Penn State University and the United Kingdom House of Commons to the U.S. Department of Commerce and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency have cleared the climate scientists of any wrongdoings. There is no massive conspiracy by the climate scientists to... Uh, <laughs> deliberately uh, manipulate and cover up data. As far as I'm concerned, the only thing that the climate scientists were guilty of was poor use of language. A rule of successful advocacy is never allow the other side to define the terms of the discussion. 
That's why I call the entire three ring climate circus yes, by what the real crime is, Hackergate. And my question is, why aren't the so-called law and order right wingers out there attempting to track down the actual criminal or criminals who did the real hacking? Let's go on to refute uh, one of David's outrageous uh, remarks. Dave was very nonchalant about saying that he, quote, could live with a two degree increase in the Earth's surface temperature. He treated it just like a walk in the park. Well, I've got news for everybody. Uh, this is a very serious business. And here's the title of, one of, here's the title of, of, of uh, something from uh, Joseph Rom's climate blog. Earth is heating faster than we realized making two degree Celsius limit for global warming more urgent. And again, that's from uh, Climate Progress posted on October 6th of this year, the blog by Joseph Rom from the uh, Center for American Progress. Rom was a physicist and the former Clinton-Gore administration's assistant secretary of energy for energy efficiency and renewable energy. Quote, there is solid, e solid scientific evidence for concluding that humanity should be working as hard as possible to keep total warming under 2 degrees Celsius, unquote. Rob makes the convincing case that the 2 degrees Celsius target is a technically and economically feasible goal to achieve when considering uh, the benefits of energy efficiency and is, quote, scientifically defensible, unquote. Let's move on to discuss why climate uncertainty should be an even greater call for immediate action. Now David P. Stat passed out a piece of claptrap from Stephen Akunin that appeared in the Wall Street Journal. And by the way, in case you didn't know, uh, the journal has a notorious climate denying, delaying editorial policy. Well, Joseph Rom wrote an excellent rebuttal entitled, The Wall Street Journal Publishes Long Debunked Myths to Promote Climate Inaction which was posted on his Climate Progress blog September 22nd of this year. Now, that was the basis behind my question to David. Quote, isn't uncertainty a major reason why climate action is so urgent? Then Tim Bolger wanted me to clarify my question, and I hit him by, fo by following up with this one. Why don't we take immediate action on policy because of the uncertainties about local weather so that we uh, don't stick our heads in the sand? You see, David doesn't think that uh, we should have any climate protection policy. According to Joseph Rom, quote, uncertainty increases the moral necessity of climate action for two main reasons, unquote. The first reason has to do with, quote, how catastrophic the worst case scenario is. That's because inaction makes the chances of a best case scenario, tolerable or manageable impacts, very small, unquote. <coughs> But Ram goes on to address the point raised by my clarifying question, quote, but uncertainty at the smaller scale is also a key reason we must act. <clears throat> Critics of climate models like Kunin like, often note that they aren't able to make accurate predictions of local weather. That's true, and that's why making, that's, and that makes waiting and adapting a far more costly proposition, unquote. We can briefly look at our own weather weirdness of extreme weather right here in the uh, land of Lincoln. Two years ago, virtually all of our state, about 95%, was declared a disaster area because of severe heat wave and a prolonged drought. Last winter, we experienced a pattern called the polar vortex, an almost never-ending cycle of being pounded by sub-zero Arctic temperatures, thawed by huge snowstorms. David deliberately did not discuss climate policy because he doesn't think we should have one. But David didn't stop uh, here. In his concluding remarks, he said that he and I, quote, are not qualified to make any recommendations about policy. That's one of the reasons I'm doing this rebuttal presentation, because he really should uh, speak for himself. Uh, my cr educational credentials in biology, environmental <coughs> studies, and anthropology combined with my 44 plus years of experience, make me uniquely qualified to make policy recommendations about a wide variety of environmental, energy, conservation, resource, and population issues. At the same time, activists from all walks of life with different backgrounds uh, speak up at public hearings and meetings and send messages to governmental officials and agencies. They volunteer their own time, money, and talents to work to improve the quality of life for themselves, their families, and their friends by making our neighborhoods, cities, towns, 
country and world safer and healthier, more sustainable places to live. Quite frankly, climate deniers and delayers should be responded to, refuted, and shut down. Climate deniers and delayers should get out of the way and stop impeding real progress by committed climate activists such as myself uh, to solving our climate crisis. Well, what kind of climate protection policy should we have? Our paramount goal is to, first off, stabilize our climate disruption pollution within a 10-year period, which we're in the middle of right now, and then secondly, rapidly reduce our climate disrupting pollution to the atmospheric level of 350 parts per million. An international agreement with a strict timetable for substantial cuts in our climate disrupting pollution in order to reach the ultimate goal of at least a total of 80% reduction by 2050, and we must include China. Number two, a price on carbon. Number three, strict enforcement by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, U.S. EPA, of the carbon rule for current fossil fuel power plants to cut their carbon emissions roughly 30% by 2030. However, the carbon rule must not be misused to help out financially troubled nuclear power plants. In my oral, oral and written comments to the U.S. EPA, I recommended that the carbon rule should be the regulatory driver to promote a non-fossil fuel and non-nuclear energy strategy called carbon-free, nuclear-free. Energy use reassessment, greatly increased energy efficiency, combined heat and power, appropriate renewable energy technologies, and a smart electricity grid with advanced uh, energy storage. Now what would uh, beneficially happen to our economy between 2010 and 2030 if we aggressively pursued these inherently cleaner energy choices to cut our carbon pollution to over 50% below uh, 205 levels. The savings on our energy bills, largely from greater energy efficiency, can more than make up for the cost of vehicle and building improvements and implementation of new renewable energy technologies. Business, businesses would save some $255 billion in energy costs Residential consumers would save about $900 per household on average. Number four, I'm very big on green architecture, ecologically sustainable buildings. In fact, across the board, the building sector is our largest producer of climate disrupting pollution. Architecture 2030, a nonprofit initiative supported by the American Institute of Architects and others, is promoting aggressive energy reductions, renewable energy use, and carbon pollution cuts within the building sector for cities around our nation and the world. These cities uh, which take up this challenge to commit to construct newer buildings and renovate existing ones to reduce their carbon pollution and fossil fuel consumption by about 50 percent and by uh, the year 2030 attain the goal of carbon neutrality uh, with all their buildings. In May 2006, Architecture 2030 worked with the mayors of Chicago, Seattle, Miami, and Albuquerque to introduce Resolution Number 50, adopting the 2030 Challenge for All Buildings, which was adopted that same month by the U.S. Conference of Mayors. During June 2006, Resolution Number 50 was unanimously <coughs> approved. Number five, a modern agriculture is a successful failure. Uh, what can we do to grow a better world? Implement it intelligently, Measures to transform farming can enhance profits and make the agricultural sector a major contributor to solving our climate crisis. It is possible to feed a growing population by organic, lower carbon production farming techniques. A combination of no-till agriculture, farming without plowing with organic agriculture is a great way to sequester carbon in the soil. Just say no to proposed Exelon nuclear bailout in Springfield. Now David said that, quote, nuclear is making a comeback, unquote, without providing any further elaboration and substantiation. We must ask, why should nuclear make any comeback at all? Nuclear power was given its shot. All we have to show for it is a nuclear power failure. Again, my little play on words again. 
It's one of the biggest governmental and business policy blunders in history with no net benefits for our society and the environment. We must take control of our energy present and future. We must critically examine the nuclear industry's fuzzy map the numbers about the impact of Exelon's nuclear reactors to, on our state's economy by the Nuclear Energy Institute, NEI, the nuclear industry's trade group, simply don't add up. A deliberately biased report released la early last <coughs> month by the NEI used inflated numbers that, were, that are inconsistent with what the Illinois General Assembly was given and completely leaves out critical and substantial information which could seriously contradict its findings. Exelon has publicly announced that at least five of its reactors here in the land of Lincoln are uneconomical. The uh, <laughs> wondering, the um, guilty uh, culprits are Quad Cities 1 and 2, Byron 1 and 2, and Clinton. Exelon wants the Illinois General Assembly this spring to approve a rate increase that would put an initial $580 million bailout. That's $580 million bailout, folks, into Exelon's big pockets to keep these financially troubled reactors running. These economically failing reactors simply can't compete with lower cost wind, solar, and efficiency. Exelon is the beneficiary of the NEI report. Exelon contributes more than $7.2 million each year to the Nuclear Energy Institute. Exelon CEO Philip Crane is the NEI's current chair. According to Dave Kraft, director of the Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS, quote, these facts cast legitimate criticism on the report's accuracy, unquote. Let's respond to several more of David's outrageous comments. Now, David said in, quote, 10 years we aren't going to be hearing about it, unquote. Of course, David is talking about climate disruption. It probably doesn't surprise anybody that I say the complete opposite. Our global climate crisis is not just going to magically disappear in a decade. It's going to be around for a long time. The question is, what are we going to do about it? We're going to hear about it more and more. Of course, David also had to take a swipe at one of the climate deniers and delayers' favorite whipping boys, who's Al Gore. According to David, Al Gore, quote, got the science wrong in an inconvenient truth. Well, what else is he going to say? Uh, the I'll climate scientists the who saw wrong. the movie disagree, but David doesn't accept what they say anyway. Uh, no more outbursts, please. Uh, wait for the questions and answers, and we have a rebuttal session. But Al Gore got the politics let's, wrong. Let's, I said no more outbursts. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll, 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 I'll have people removed, and I'm serious about that. Okay? All right. <laughs> the climate scientists who saw the movie disagree, but David doesn't accept what they say anyway. I saw the movie and read the book. Uh, the movie presented the issue accurately enough for the general moving viewing audience. At the same time, the movie Inconvenient Truth uh, could have spelled out more clearly what actions uh, we can take. The book goes into much more detail about what you and I can do. Well, I'm going to wrap up this by quoting journalist, researcher, Nobel Prize winner, and former Vice President Al Gore, founder and chair of the Climate Reality Project and Generation in Investment Management. Quote, in the struggle to solve the climate crisis, a powerful, largely unnoticed shift is taking place. I'm going to wrap this up by quoting journalist, researcher, Nobel Prize winner, and former Vice President Al Gore, founder and chair of the Climate Reality Project and Generation Investment Management. Quote, in the struggle to solve the climate crisis, a powerful, largely unnoticed shift is taking place. The forward journey for human civilization will be difficult and dangerous but it is now clear that we will ultimately prevail. The only question is how quickly yeah. we can accelerate and complete the transition to a okay. low-carbon okay. civilization, okay. unquote. While some serious and irreversible damage to our planet's ecological system is unavoidable, quote, the truly catastrophic damages that have the potential for ending civilization as we know it can still most certainly be avoided. Moreover, the pace of the changes already set in motion can still be moderated significantly, unquote. That ends the formal presentation. Thanks for your patience and let's have some questions. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, by the way, sir, I just thought your outburst proved my point.
about him being one of the big whipping boys along with Dr. Michael Mann. So thanks for helping prove my point. All right. Um, uh, Karina? Okay, this may be an inappropriate question, but um, okay. uh, years oh, yeah. ago I sponsored a talk. Uh, I invited John Adel of the plant to come. John Adel had the plant. Uh, it, it was a building that did it was a meat packing factory that he repurposed. It's a vertical farm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I just today was at the plant, and, you know, he has all these businesses, and everything's cradle to cradle, and all outputs become inputs to new processes. The progress is so slow. It takes so long for things to get done. Um, it, it, is it a pipe dream to have sustainability, to have... Um, you know, and then you brew beer, and then your waste goes into my uh, stomach, which then the the um, to create heat, the digester thing that creates. Yeah, I mean, it's, is, a, is methane, that, it's a methane digester. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, is is that really? It's just I was just there today, and and it takes so long to get anything done, and everything's based on grants and needing and making so little profit. I mean, is it really? I can't take this it's not a real. Do you think that that could really be a sustainable, yes, uh, actual sure. business model, a, a actual profitable business model? Well, it's being tried elsewhere. I'm not familiar specifically with what's going on that's in the back of the yards. I attended his presentation here at the college and was impressed with that. I haven't uh, toured the facility. I understand, Frank, that you have, that yes. you did take a tour, and maybe it's Frank can maybe provide some insights. I'm not, I'm not sure about the specifics of the operation. I do know that overall sustainability is the way to go for companies. I've got a book here, me co-authored by. Feasible business model. Yeah, but I'm just. I mean, I really had a question. It's, it's I know, really but I'm just saying, in other in, in other cases, sustainability is the way to go. I've got a book entitled Climate Capitalism that's co-authored by L. Hunter Lovins that documents a lot of different cases. I'm not getting off the subject. I'm just saying that you got to be careful not to judge everything by just one model. And I'm not sure about what the problems are and what he's doing to resolve them because I haven't been out there. I haven't talked with him. So, Can you make a profitable business or something that doesn't depend on government and grants? Other companies are doing other business models sustainably, and that's all I can say. I'm not familiar with the specific vertical farm in the back of the yards, but sustainability is the way to go. It can be profitable. Companies can cut their waste, solid waste. They can reduce their pollution and have happy employers. Em employees, because I know it's being done, are, are being done around the country. Hey, can I just ask for an example, and I'll shut up after that. No. What's an example, please, of a business that is cradle to cradle, or? <clears throat> well, I'm not talking about necessarily cradle to cradle. I wasn't referring to that. Uh, I was referring to uh, the companies. There's a book at the library about Colorado companies that are uh, reducing their toxic pollution in their manufacturing processes, things like that. I'm not talking about a cradle-to-cradle -cradle, uh, operation. That's, that's, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't referring to that. And that's something that, again, uh, if he's got problems, he's got to solve. But um, that's something to lo look into if there's other cradle-to-cradle uh, -cradle operations that are, more, that are more successful doing similar things to what he's doing as far as the vertical farm. I'm not putting off your question, it's just that I just don't know about his specific operation, but I know in other companies, whether they're cradle to cradle or not, sustainability is paying off. Bill Wentz? Yeah, are you at all familiar with what Alexander the Great did to the Gordian knot? And what was that exactly? <laughs> well, he was told that whoever done did that Gordian knot would conquer the world. Instead of trying to unravel it, he cut it. So, what's your question? Well, regarding the presentation. Well, I, I, it's not just your presentation. It's what I hear all the time. Everybody's trying to unravel the Gordian knot, but there are ways of cutting it. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, and next, next question, please. <laughs> okay. You know, Dennis, I'm in a lot of agreement with you about the trends on climate change. I just can't see why e nuclear cannot be a part of the solution. Can you comment, please, and tell me why you're, you're su take such an anti-stance against what I may consider a, a good, reliable alternative to fossil fuels? 
it's not a good reliable alternative. As you said before, for the best bang for the buck, if you're going to keep more carbon out of the atmosphere faster, you want to focus upon uh, greater energy efficiency and what's called micropower, which is combined heat and power or cogeneration and appropriate renewable energy technologies. Uh, nuclear power has a host of problems that are serious and unresolved, and they should be limiting factors. The radioactive waste issue is a, uh, it should be a limiting factor. I told you about the house that my f late father built when we were growing up, lived in. We had, well, a, a bathroom and a half. We had the major bathroom, and then we had the half bath downstairs for him to shower, you know, because he would do, do stuff around the house. Now, my father, and you can talk to any contractor, wouldn't consider building a house or any building without a bathroom, without a toilet. This is precisely what the attitude of the nuclear industry is. The nuclear industry wants to go ahead and build these reactors. I know you support a thorium fuel cycle, and the amount of radioactive waste is debatable. I don't buy the 1%, by the way, that okay. John and you like to say, okay. because there's no uh, commercial substantiation. There's no commercial operating experience to that. Okay. And we're going ahead without any kind of uh, federally, li federally licensed, proven, uh, radioactive waste repository. Okay. In other words, to be quite honest with you, we have a nuclear power industry that needs to be potty trained. <coughs> That's basically the way I, the way right. I see it. Right. Charles. And there's other, there's other issues too, the weapons right. proliferation and other things that should be limiting factors, plus nuclear power <coughs> is too slow an <coughs> energy Coffee. source to do anything effectively. Coffee. Your proposed uh, commercial thorium fuel cycle oh, doesn't even exist and even so, uh, you're going to have to uh, have the uh, NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and we don't have that much confidence in NEIS for the NRC. It's not, re not really concerned with the Nuclear Reassurance Commission. But even then, they, they're going to have to write the regulations for this stuff. It's a completely different reactor design. Your uh, molten salt, uh, thorium fluoride reactor, whatever you want to call it, and so it's just, it just not, to me, a, a, viable, a viable solution, whereas uh, the things that I'm talking about are way out ahead. Oh, by the way, 75% uh, of all the nuclear reactors under construction are uh, over, over, uh, or under, are over, bud are over budget, they're behind schedule, and they have cost overruns, and that includes most of the ones in China. So, all right, Thank you, Charles. Man. Yeah, David, your you, part of your plan was that all farm farming would be through a no-till process. I lived for ten years in rural areas. Are you the one that's going to go to some farmer in Nebraska and tell him he's going to have to spend a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars for new equipment to do no-till farming? Well, that's a good question. I probably won't be the one doing it, but uh, we need to I mean, are you gonna, get the government are you going to the door and go We need to get the government programs and policies going. If you're familiar with uh, the Rodale Institute's doing research on this stuff, and it seems feasible, and that's one of the things that you know that we that we need that we need to work on. Oh, you get it's, it. it's a good possible. It's a good possibility. It's well documented in, in the uh, book on food in climate capitalism, and it's something that uh, we should uh, at least uh, explore. We're spending money on a lot of other things. We're spending, uh, wasting a lot of other money on corporate farm subsidies for agribusiness for these uh, factory farms. Uh, we can uh, take that money and put it into something that's uh, gonna, gonna help the climate. Liz Weiger? Uh, uh, did did uh, Al Gore have some economic connections to the oil industry? Uh, I've heard about that, and I'm really not going to get into that because I've heard a lot of different things about Al Gore as a personality, whether he has connections with the oil industry, whether he does. just reinvented the internet, and he and Tipper are the basis for love story. And it's just to me, it's just a bunch of horse crap. Now maybe the oil company thing, but it's just like you know, he's a credible source, and you can and, he, and he's and, he, and scientists have independently saying. You know, what, he's taking what the scientists have independently concluded. I don't want to get into all that stuff because it really, it doesn't really impress me. I don't think, I don't think it decreases his credibility, not, not to my way of thinking. If there's any uh, conflicts of interest, that he's going to have to work that out for himself. Yeah, Sid, Todd? 
Who did you call? Said. Do you think with uh, the mad rush for profits, like the Koch brothers have about $80 billion, and they can make $100 billion more, you think capitalism could really solve the problem? I don't think so. What do you think? That's one of the barriers to climate capitalism that's actually mentioned in the book is the Koch brothers. They're a major um, uh, barrier. Uh, they're, the pri they're, pr they're the primary reason why uh, the Congress has moved so far to the hard radical right now and uh, why we're going to have an even tougher time getting, the, getting this stuff through. All right, David. David yes. Zucker. Um, what do you make of the prospects for, for reform in terms of climate change and so on? Uh, both in Washington with the advent of the new Congress and with the arrival of the new governor in Springfield. Does I'll take everybody hear the question? Yeah, oh, no. Okay, why don't you repeat it, David? All right, my question is, what are the prospects for reform in, in the, the speaker's opinion in view of the uh, arrival, advent of the new Congress in Washington and the advent of the new governor in Springfield? I'll take the state first. Uh, the implementation of the carbon rule that I've mentioned is given to each state to decide. I don't know what our new Republican governor, gov governor thinks about uh, climate. Again, we have heavily uh, Democratic legislature in Springfield, so um, hopefully if he can at least, if he doesn't see the sense of reason, at least he'd be pushed in the right direction. That's the short one. Uh, the way that people vote People are voting for like whether they had trouble online with Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, which is not a topic tonight. But the health costs due to uh, climate disruption, we can discuss because they are real and potential. Uh, it's, it, doesn't not, it does not look good uh, for the reasons I've mentioned. Number one, I knew that was going to happen about wanting to push through the Keystone XL pipeline. I saw something in red eye that confirmed my suspicions, and again, I did go online to send some action alerts to our two senators to vote against a bill. Uh, it's already passed the House, and it's not going to the Senate, and with, of course, the majorities in each. The second thing that they're going to want to do is to undo the carbon rule that I've mentioned. The third thing is, I think this is, there's, it's funny if it weren't so pathetic. On Tuesday, I mentioned that the U.S.-China came out with their own, their own climate agreement. The Republican re deniers and delayers in Congress are going bonkers. They are just going bonkers, and so is Fox News. And you have to understand why. You're dealing with climate deniers and delayers. Now, when I gave my rebuttal to, 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 to David on September 27th, they just they don't just deny the reality of human induced climate disruption. They want to delay any immediate action to it. And eight years of Bush and Cheney, climate deniers and delayers, all the finger pointing, well, you expect us to reduce our emissions, China, but what about you? That's been the one major excuse that they've been doing all along with this agreement. It's a great step in the right direction, but I still are, they're still cautious. I'm still cautious because there's some caveats, we, and I will want to discuss that. In other words, that gives them a harder justification to say that we shouldn't do anything about it. See, this is all a thought, uh, this is all going to uh, kind of be an introduction. This is all going to come about in December of next year. It's the international conference in Paris, France. And this China-U.S. agreement is hopefully will provide a framework in making it easier to get that done. This has been the one major stumbling block. In 2006, I looked all this stuff up today just to refresh, China surpassed us in terms of our, our uh, greenhouse gas uh, pollution. That, and, and, we, and, and there are problems with it I have, and we can discuss that. It's not perfect, but at least a good step in the right direction. We need to watch it carefully. But it... Not, if it doesn't cut that excuse out, it's going to make all the deniers and delayers much harder to justify. But it's going to be a lot harder with um, the Republican Party the way it is, with the, uh, the Tea Party Republicans in control of both the House and Senate, which makes our work, we have to double, triple our efforts here. Gene Harker. 
Uh, yeah, is there a glossary available for those of us who are not up on some of these terms like cradle to cradle and, uh, and no-till farming? Um, you can go online. You know, if, if you're anybody who's computer savvy, you can go, in, go online and type in the search engine any of this stuff, information will come. Uh, for what it's worth, there's printed books I've seen at bookstores about uh, uh, conservation, environmental science, and all, all that. And there's, um, you know, like there's, a, there's, a, there's fundamental books that you can also uh, get at bookstores. Um, and you can look, look it up online, yeah, but you'll have to look it up online or go to a bookstore. That's, that's a good question, though. Thank you. I don't have, I don't, I don't have, I have a recommended reading list and I thought maybe I would have copies of the presentation because I wasn't able to have any handouts for everybody. And there's a recommended reading list that has uh, books about the climate issue, but there's nothing specific about what you're saying, but th there, there are books out there. Just to go online or, or go to a bookstore. Thank you. Oh, Francisco. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. Today I heard that Chile, the capital is Chile, have put a tax on carbon emissions, Good. and it have stopped the building of a hydroelectric dam, and they have started a big project on solar panels, uh, a big, big, big solar uh, generating plant. The question that sounds good that, to me. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. Yeah, but. Uh, the, the most important thing to me was stopping the hydroelectric dam because these hydroelectric dams, they have very, very <coughs> negative environmental issues with them. And so China is suffering now from the Three Gorges Dam and a, a tremendous damage to the environment and to the fisheries and everything else that Chile who have so much uh, river coming from the from the Andes have decided to stop that. It's a, it, it requires a lot of thinking and a lot of forward, uh, you know, yeah. policy. As a general principle, I support hydro because it's a renewable energy source. But again, with caveats, you have to be careful. I support smaller scale, what's called micro hydro. <coughs> but the big stuff, what Frank is saying, you've got to really be careful. Uh, any building any newer projects, particularly in uh, developing nations because of uh, the flooding of uh, rainforest, uh, displacement of uh, di uh, indigenous people, um, destruction of wildlife habitat, things like that. And the, and like, the life of the dam <coughs> because as the sediment fell on the so dam, it, it reduced to a, to, to not, not a dam anymore, and so that, re that removal of this uh, uh, nutrients who should go to the sea are, are taken there. So the fisheries suffer because they don't have the nutrients. And that's what China is encountering, that now yeah, they are right. killing their fisheries. They are dying. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I've, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, tidal power? Uh, yeah. Is, 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 is for it? Yes, I am. Yes. I, Proper right. site, sure. Something that needs to be right. looked at, Tetarama. developed, sure. Uh, yeah. Wave tidal, not tidal wave, but wave tidal, also what's called ocean thermal gradients, that kind of stuff. Um, do you think that uh, we have a good chance of reversing the environmental trajectory we're on uh, without replacing um, our governments, these pro-growth, uh, pro-carbon, pro-consumption, corporate-owned governments? In other words, do you think that we can do this, change the way the world is going, environmentally speaking, without a freaking revolution? We can have a non-violent revolution. I didn't say violent or non-violent. No, 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 no. You're, you're, I'm, I'm saying it from, I'm, I wasn't arguing with you. I'm taking your language and I'm putting it, phrasing it, because everybody, as soon as they hear revolution, oh, all kinds of violence and guns, and I, I'm just saying, from my standpoint, let's have a non-violent revolution. Of revolution. We had an estimated 400,000 people who marched in the street in New York City at the time of the uh, UN uh, climate summit there, including uh, people from here, from NEIS, and the carbon-free, nuclear-free constituency. That reminds me of one of um, David's wit and witticisms I wanted to rebut. 
Um, he talked about the hole in the ozone layer as nothing. I just saw something on the climate blog from Joseph Fromm saying that um, ozone layer healing itself because of, well, basically because of international cooperation, see. What happened was uh, the two scientists, two chemists, just, you know, realized and discovered that chlorofluorocarbon CFCs were uh, depleting the ozone in the upper um, atmospheric, the upper stratosphere. Uh, countries banded together, and uh, we got past the Montreal Protocol in 1987 that uh, banned and phased out these things. That's an example of something that, that, that can work, I'm just saying. And that's the hope that, that is actually some say, Dr. Michael Mann of Penn State University says that uh, Paris, France is our last hope, our last chance of getting a, a, um, a, a really good international agreement. And we've really got to push for it. So you've got to always be positive, but the answer is yes. But it's going to, going to have to, as uh, you know, Bill McKibben says, we've got to really double and triple our work out there. The answer is yes to what? Exactly. Yes, we Demonstrations. That's emails, not, that's not necessarily I mean, revolution. everything Do that... Do we require a revolution or not? Yes. A nonviolent revolution, we a nonviolent revolution uh, in thinking, the way... In, and a nonviolent revolution in the way that we think. What the fuck? Um, what do you mean? A lot of people are looking at the climate issue backwards. You need to look forward, okay? We have a scientific consensus. We have a disinformation, disinformation campaign. And from there, where do we go? We need uh, we need to you know to do something better with our noggins up here rather than saying, oh look at the polar vortex as uh, Rush Limbaugh said, you know environmental wackos. And I've got something about that. Um, I participated in a poll. I was on um, the Climate Progress blog and this popped up from Personal Liberty, which is. Uh, libertarian horse crap stuff that David's into that spoke here. And I voted in our Rush Limbaugh Volar Vortex, Vortex, do record-breaking cold temperatures prove global warming a hoax? And here's we have, here we have right here, we have the guy himself, we have old, good old Rush. I made a copy of this, good old Rush here. And do you, like Rush, believe that the polar vortex was made up by the media? 78, 71% voted yes. It's just another term the liberal media made up to push the global warming, warming agenda. Eh, wrong answer. 19% voted no. No, this is a weather term that has been around for years. Eh, yes, Al Roker, uh, meteorologist from NBC, uh, put Rush in his place. It should be Hush Limbaugh, not Rush Limbaugh. And 10% voted not sure. And um, do you think climate change, global warming is real or a hoax? 11% voted climatic change is real as is seen in the extreme changes in temperature and weather we are experiencing. Correct answer, but only 11%. 87% voted climate change is a hoax. There is no proof that global warming is a real scientific event. And 2% voted, I don't know. I'm just saying people are looking at this stuff backwards. You've got to understand and look forward, understanding what I said, and then look at you know extreme weather events and things like that that were going on around the globe, which actually substantiate uh, the, the, my, 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 the position of my presentation this evening. The next question. Well, um, Daniel Fanuzzi. So, net zero energy construction is completely achievable. As a matter of fact, buildings can produce energy provided they have infrastructure to store. Yes. I know this firsthand. I was just wondering, though, as an activist, what your position is on the lead building system, which is it's, it's really kind of a, a, a point burning system <laughs> that, it, that has kind of veered the construction industry in a certain direction, but very far from net zero energy or anything that could possibly achieve sustainable construction. So have you, have you, I don't know what your opinion is on that system, whether that needs an overhaul or what direction is actually. Yeah. Dennis, explain a question, please. I don't understand what you just said. 
There is a. Uh, okay. She's well, talking first off. Well, first off, but, okay, let me. I'll just yeah. answer the question. If she's talking about what's called a zero net energy building, this is a building that is so energy efficient that it uh, produces all of its uh, power, its energy from renewable energy sources. Uh, what she's talking about is a. It's a voluntary by the U.S. Green Buildings Council lead leadership in energy and environmental design. It's a voluntary rating system for buildings, and you're given points for, um, for what you do. You can get points if you have a bicycle rack out, um, in, you know, out, out in front. Um, there's different views about LEED, and I know that. What's your view? Well, my view is that at least it's a good step in the right direction, though it's voluntary, though obviously we need to do more, because I definitely support uh, the zero net energy stuff. Uh, for what it's worth, um, it's very few times that I'm shocked. I'll get action alerts that there will be a pre-prepared script. Well, I was shocked by it. I'm thinking, oh, come on. I'm disgusted. I mean, but I... but. I received an email from the city that as, as of uh, Friday, October 31st of this year, the Center for Green Technology, a platinum LEED certified building here in Chicago, was closed to the public uh, for good. That shocked me because I've been there. It's really cool. I attended some workshops and seminars there. The businesses are still there, but it's close to the general public. I guess that Rahm Emanuel is too interested in giving you know, TIF money for Boeing for its headquarters than to spend it on something sensible like keeping uh, the Center for Green Technology open. I just wanted to point out that that was a platinum certified building and it was a showcase and now closed. Where was it located? Well, 445 North Sacramento mm -hmm. yeah. in, wow. Humble, in the Humble Park neighborhood. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I can attend. Andy, Andy. Just a moment. While uh, I, I, I'm listening to this, I am seeing little white specks swirling around. Yeah, so am I. I'm seeing snow. And, uh, That's the satellite. I, I warned everybody uh, to watch out for any of you. It's only it is. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, you're <laughs> right. Okay. 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 Yes, yeah. I, uh, I and. I, I, you were I, uh, talking about uh, net zero buildings just a minute ago. Yeah. yeah. Are, are you familiar with the, the German concept of considering buildings as a source of energy for the community? That's exactly with, uh, what With rooftop solar panels and other things where buildings actually generate more electricity that's than they, the energy than they use. Yes. And buildings feed yeah. energy into the grid. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about, but we don't have a grid that can store that energy. Well, it doesn't have to be stored. It, it can be fed into the Transfer. grid. Yeah. You know, just if a building is a net producer, you know, it's a fantastic way to go green. Also, one final I'm thing. I'm familiar with it. Are you, do you have copies of ComEd's internal report from January of a year and a half? Would it be this January? No, Two I years don't. ago, ComEd put out a report saying that by 2015, at the rate we're going, by the middle of 2015, it'll make economic sense for two-thirds of American households to go solar. Solar has dropped in price and is competitive yep. right now nationwide. There's a revolution going on that our media aren't talking uh -huh. about. That's another kind of revolution that, again, it wasn't just a, a, a ideas and assumptions revolution and, um, and, and people getting out activism, but it's also the revolutions taking place in uh, what I call sustainable energy with uh, costs coming down and implementation and all kinds of nice market-based incentives. Just wanted to point out, we support, again, as I said, carbon-free, nuclear-free, and Arjun Makajani is the physicist and engineer with the Institute for Energy and Environmental Research who put the report together. He says that we need zero net energy, uh, not just individual buildings, but neighborhoods, communities, cities, so very definitely so. All right, Ayala. Yeah, I'll ask the your evolution question in a different way because I think he meant more than a change in uh, energy. Um, do you think there is a relationship between the fact that Western Europe, Germany, Denmark, the uh, Netherlands, uh, Scandinavia, are much further than us in adapting and it making major alteration, it relationship between that and the fact 
that they, are, they all have safety net, nets for people and um, an economic a tax economic structure that um, makes house. life oh, much more yeah. uh, right. much more equal and um, and happy and content for, for its people. Is there a relationship between the two and why? Well, in a second, you're talking about how governments, of course, you know, government programs and stuff, and how governments care for their people and everything. Again, uh, Germany is a solar is a solar energy leader. Uh, Denmark is a wind energy leader. Here in the United States, by contrast, we we have to deal with all the you know the climate denier and delayer horse crap. And that's basically what I, what I call it. Um, you've got uh, uh, and you've got basically now you've got. You know, control of both uh, the House and Senate, backed up by big money, and particularly the, the Koch brothers. And all this is interconnected with uh, delaying implementation of what you're talking about and keeping uh, the, uh, you know, the, 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 the large subsidies for what uh, writer and no nuker Harvey Wasserman calls King Kong, uh, if I can get the initials correctly, C-O-N-G, coal, oil, nuclear, and gas. We need to remove the subsidies for what Wasserman calls King Kong. Did I answer your question? Uh, a little bit, but it looks like this is, the answer is yes, we, it will require revolution because under this <coughs> economic and cultural structure, we're not going there. Not going to happen. Right? Okay. Charles? Not by yeah, now. um, right Dennis. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Uh, you're right. You mentioned in your presentation, you said our plan mm -hmm. must include China. Yes. And how many Chinese manufacturers are among the largest, most severest polluters you're going to find anywhere? Are you going to go knock on the factory door and say, hey, you got to stop making money and be pollution free? Do you think their government's going to do anything? Uh, that's a good question. That's one of the issues. Well, there's a lot of I mean, under. I mean, I just read that they one of their biggest polluters is a factory that makes solar panels. I know, Charlie, and I'm involved with that. We have a whole lot of emails that are under the radar that people here don't know about. With John Kirch, who's the director of the Thorium Energy Alliance, <laughs> you, myself, and Tim. Uh, and, and, and Dave Kraft from NAS <coughs> were getting into verbal Donning Brooks online. And the majority, and, and Tim's laughing and, and knows exactly what I'm talking about. No, it about. looks like the trouble I've and, started is really no, that, no, that's good. I like, the, I like that kind of trouble. Okay. And, and to my, and he mentioned, oh, well, the, you've got protests outside a uh, plant because it's dumping its waste into a, a stream. I say, go to it. Let the Chinese protest. On a localized level, protests are fine. If they go larger scale, there might be problems with the military. But I agree with, you know, I, I agree with that. Uh, companies should practice what they preach. It seems ironic. It's a problem that is known within the industry. Uh, World Watch Institute has something about it. So John Kirch is trying to manipulate, warp, and twist this into saying, oh, we need nuclear, and that solar is dirty, and, and everything. And, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I've been an organizer of, you know, all kinds of activities for over 44 years now, and if I could go over there, I'd go over there and be the first one to uh, help them organize. But unfortunately, that's not the case. But they are doing it, and all I can say is that uh, companies uh, need to, uh, you know, they need to clean up their act um, as as they do here. That's, did I answer your question? Yes. Well. Let me just rephrase and I'm not going to go on that. These guys don't follow any laws, child labor, nothing. They're ruthless. <laughs> and the government who preaches to them ecology is kind of like talking to yourself, man. Charlie, you're going to have to separate. I know I may, I don't know if I want to take anybody They're off. We've got, to, we've got to take those issues and put those aside because this is the first time in history we have an agreement Sorry. between the U.S. and China. It's a story. And all this other stuff you're talking about is going to be resolved somewhere else because we, 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 this, we've got to keep this agreement. 
I, I, it's not perfect by any means, but we've got to keep it as a framework what we're going to do. And you've got to keep your eye on the prize next year, December in Paris, France, when all the nations get together. This has to be done. I'm not, I'm not saying I support child labor. I'm not saying I support labor abuse. I've done actual or stuff, all this sort of stuff. But you've got to have to make a distinction between, you know, you actually had people from the Obama administration. You had Secretary of State John Kerry, Secretary of Energy Ernest Moniz, uh, John Holdren, Obama's Chief Science and Technology Advisor, John Podestra, and so on, sitting across the table from the, Jap from the Chinese getting this agreement and, and that's something that's, that's historic because it's never been done and that's the thing that we need to, to, to focus on now and, and so these other issues need to be resolved in good time. The Chinese know something needs to be done. Uh, they're going solar, they're going wind, um, they're building nuclear which is a mistake. Uh, they, I mean, they're, they're major cities like Beijing are so polluted that you see people walking around wearing uh, masks on. I mean, they, they know something has to be done. So, that, I guess that's the best agreement we could reach at the time. Uh, but at the same time, the, it's, 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 it's better than nothing. But these other issues are things that, um, that need to be uh, resolved uh, separately. Because otherwise we're going to have so much thrown into the, thrown into the mix that we weren't, we weren't going to get the agreement at all. And the, the immediate urgency is this agreement. Uh, Larry Roth? Yes, sir. Uh, a question on uh, uh, fracking. Uh, uh, what, what's Thank the, you. What, what's the downside on fracking? Larry uh, brought that up earlier and I told him to uh, ask about it. Um, Oh, that's one of another David's uh, wit and witticisms when he was here. He said we won't be able to stop fracking. Well, that's a good attitude. I mean, let's you know, let's don't you know, let's don't try to do anything. Let's we shouldn't try to we shouldn't have tried to abolish slavery. We shouldn't have tried to give women the right to vote. I mean, I mean, there's a host of things that people can think of in terms of social change and social improvement. Basically, fracking is a combination of hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling. That's the reason why uh, natural gas is so, uh, well, I was going to say artificially low in price nowadays. The reason I say that is because a lot of the economic costs to the communities, the social costs, the environmental costs are taking place. Uh, as I said before, that the, uh, the downstate fracking organization has filed suit against the Illinois Department of Natural Resources uh, and our governor, current governor, uh, to uh, throw out the uh, fracking rules, which are way too weak and way too inadequate. I was involved with the comment process on the fracking rules. My view is that the uh, state legislature should have revisited at least a two-year moratorium on fracking. I would like to see a permanent uh, ban on fracking uh, everywhere. And I've, I've talked okay. about this in action alerts. 100 million acres of uh, public lands, Bureau of Land Management, I've supported that. Uh, fracking causes a lot of environmental problems. It poisons uh, groundwater. It, um, Larry mentioned the release of radon gas, which is a radioactive gas found in nature. There's also radioactivity from the radium, which is naturally occurring in the Earth's um, crust. Radium is a naturally occurring radi radioactivity that is found in the fracking wastewater. Um, People are getting sick, uh, cattle, uh, property values going down, so on and so forth. So fracking is not a good idea. NEIS is active working with the no fracking groups, and I'm active by myself in supporting all kinds of petitions saying, you know, let's, let's, let's put a ban on all fracking. We don't need natural gas as a transition to uh, a more efficient renewable energy tech, uh, economy anyway. We don't need that anyway. Well, we ping you on. So you, you think uh, uh, compare oil and natural gas, uh, you think uh, they are both are evil and uh, equally, and they should be banned for both? Good question. It's relative. Of course, uh, natural gas is a cleaner burning, <coughs> particularly when you compare coal. The, the, uh, the, that's a good question, but usually the, the comparison is between coal and natural gas. 
Uh, my oh, view yeah. is that we need to get off of all not going to call non-renewable energy sources. These are sources that natural processes are not replenishing right now. It includes oil, coal, gas, and nuclear. They all have their problems. They all have their day. You know, uh, and, and, and it's to the point where we need to make a transition uh, off of these into a more energy efficient, 100% renewable energy economy. So the answer is relative. I mean, it's, 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 we need, it's not, you know, natural gas versus oil. Uh, there are some, uh, well, you're using natural gas for buses, but still it's, it's a non-renewable energy source. Methane gas, the chemical, uh, the chemical equivalent of natural gas, I support as a renewable energy source. Uh, in fact, it's a potent greenhouse gas. That's one of the things about fracking uh, that I almost forgot to mention, that fracking does release large amounts of uh, methane gas into our atmosphere, which again, while carbon dioxide by volume is the biggest greenhouse gas, that is like 20 times more potent as a greenhouse gas, and that's uh, methane. So we need to capture this methane like from, um, from um, landfills, and we can use it to generate electricity, or purify it, put in a natural gas pipeline, or use uh, methane digesters, both like in sewage treatment plants and on farms. So, you know, the answer is, is I mean, there are some ad advantages probably with, na with natural gas being cleaner burning in terms of carbon, but overall, we want to get off of all oil and, and natural gas, as well as coal and nuclear. Uh, okay. Uh, how are we doing with the uh, time? It's 7, right now it's uh, 7.46, and oh, yes. depending on how many more questions you want to take, Dennis, or, or get into rebuttals, we still got a little time yet for some more questions. All right. Maybe one or two more questions. I really want to. I, I want to. Um, I want to really get to the rebuttals because I want to respond to some of the other some David's one-liners. And if okay. people don't ask about them, I've got a bunch of one-liners that he pulled in his final comments okay. that I want to respond to. Uh, Mike Lee and uh, uh, the information is hard to find. Yet. Is fracking primarily yeah. natural yeah. gas and oil? Well, my question is, is it primarily natural gas? Do That's you know, a good it's question. It's, it's a mystery, and I can't find it anywhere on the Internet or anywhere and anywhere. Nobody knows. Is it natural gas? What percentage is oil? That's my first question. I don't know. I know that's a good question. And normally when people think of natural, people think of fracking, they, they number one think of natural gas, but I don't know what the percentage <laughs> is of you know, oil fracking good. and gas fracking. For shale. So I don't, don't know either. No. L.P. Anderson? Okay. Uh, There's something I'll have to check on. And I don't mean that as a blow off. Because be believe me, I check on everything. If I say I'll check on something, I check on it. L.P.? Yeah. And yeah. Dennis, in all your research, uh, what do you think the collective opinion is of the, you know, 980 or 1,000 climate scientists around the world? What's their collective view of? how much time we have left to get massive programs starting before we're past the tipping point and nothing we do will matter much. How, is it, is our pro, do we have 30 years to work on this or 20 or uh, you know, how much time do we have before we get massive get programs uh, starting uh, okay. that will make a difference? There's something on, uh, there's a doc, Dr. Michael Mann who's at uh, Penn State who wrote uh, the, uh, well, it's not in his book, it's the, the, the Hockey Stick and Climate Wars that I mentioned last time when David was here. I believe he says the figure is, uh, I'm thinking that, uh, we, we, see, he, he's talking about going, not going over the two degrees Celsius mark. I think he says 2036. But I got, there's an article in Scientific American that he wrote and during the rebuttals, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig it out just to make sure. But I think that we, we've, we've got to get moving on. But I said we, we've got really until 2036. And if we don't do enough or anything after that, then we're, we're going to be going beyond the point of no return. Okay. Uh, I, have the, I have the climatologists uh, a uh, climate forecast. Oh, that's a very good question. I had a chance to meet uh, 
probably the uh, area's number one meteorologist, Tom Skilling from WGN. Mm -hmm. He and a climate scientist uh, from uh, University of Japan, mm -hmm. Urbana, spoke at a, a <coughs> breakfast uh, meeting at the, um, let's see, it's uh, Howard Learners Group, the Law Environmental Policy Center. <coughs> and uh, they said <coughs> that, um, I mean, you're talking about that's the difference between weather and climate. Weather is in a matter of days and months. He said that Tom Skilling said that the, the climate models have, have gotten uh, you know, better and better and better. But it's the point you're dealing with the uncertainties. See, that's when you're getting into the uncertainties. I mean, how many people you know, will know what the weather is going to be like exactly a year from now? I mean, that was one of the jokes that somebody said, well, you guys can have a hard time predicting the weather. How can you do climate? Everybody in the audience laughed at Tom Skilling, you know, handled it like a pro, because he used to be a denier and delayer. I didn't know that. So he started looking at the, the models and the evidence. And, you know, but the, 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 the so, I mean, we're talking about, uh, you know, ch 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 changes of climate is over, you know, hundreds and thousands of years, and weather is over, you know, days and weeks. Okay. So, uh, how many want to get into rebuttals now, Brom? All right, let's get into rebuttals. Okay. Uh, how Your many first, have I guess, I guess remarks to make to the rest of us? Oh, okay. Okay. When I get out, I'll sit over One, two, three, four, five, okay. six, seven, eight, 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 nine, at least nine. Oh, all right. Well, uh, first. probably right. about four minutes, Brom. Would uh, that be acceptable, everybody? Four minutes? Or do you want to go five? Uh, I think uh, some people will take four, and others will take five. All right. It'll be but, uh, we'll start at five. But, yeah, up to five. Okay. Um, just give me a second here to get the timer started. Laptop's not. All right, whenever you're ready. Well, it was a pleasure to be uh, in this uh, presentation because I not only admire Dennis for many years, as he really worked to make us aware of the different problems on the. On the on the uh, problems with, with nuclear power, problems with the fuels that we burn, and he does it in a very professional, mm -hmm. very scientific way. That's really unusual here. Um, yeah, the level of, 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 of thinking that we have to reach to understand the problems that we are confronted uh, is not readily available in the common population, maybe because of the schoolings that we have, the, the, the schools, the political uh, ambience where we are being abused. The United States is the only country that doesn't have maternity leave in the law. Now think, the only country that doesn't have maternity leave in the law. So a woman who have a child here, she don't go to work the day that she's delivering, she could be fired. And if she's not fired, she doesn't get paid for it that day that she meets. I mean, the only country in the world, look at what, uh, uh, how low this country have gone in the recognition of its citizens. Uh, besides that, we have a system of education that is, that is geared to create idiots that work. Idiots that don't think, that don't do anything for themselves, but they have to obey orders and punch buttons. Uh, this is uh, it's an issue that a hundred years ago, a philosopher in Spain decided as education that leads to barbarism. <laughs> and what he meant was that when education is used for the purpose of utilitarian gains, that leads to barbarism. And what happened that you have people educated who do things to make money. 
which means make nuclear power plants, now liquid fuels, and the, you know, the, the new reactors that they are. And they are not thinking for themselves. And I can tell you, I am not a nuclear engineer, but I, I've been trained as an engineer, and when they talk about these liquid uh, salt reactors, they are totally, totally ignoring the facts of the physics of what they are doing, because they are creating a situation where the temperatures of these things are below, are above the temperatures of any material that we know it will resist those temperatures. So you are going to make pumps and motors and things that they are going to operate under those temperatures. We, we don't have that. <coughs> so, so what they are leading to is to uh, a dead end, a rabbit hole that it will waste energy, money, lives and divert the, the energy and the knowledge that we need to solve the problems that they are really uh, long-term survival for the earth and, uh, and, and, and for what purposes? Because the education is designed to create profit-making robots and that's what's happening. Now, to, to talk about the energy that is accumulating, the fossil fuels, this is a tidbit of information. Every second, the sun deposits 750 terawatts, terawatts of energy mm -hmm. on the plants. And the chlorophyll photosynthesis uh, animals that convert the sun energy into chemical energy. Every second on the earth, 750 terawatts of energy from the sun, they are converted by photosynthesis into a chemical energy. Well, according to Einstein, E equals mc squared, that means that that chemical energy have weight. And how much weight that every second is accumulated on the earth because of that transformation of solar energy into chemical energy. And the answer is 1.4 grams of weight in energy accumulated. That 1.4 grams of energy feed everything on the earth. All life on the earth is derived and fed from that. Okay. So anyway, we have to really admire and, 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 okay. and be marveled by this, this, this world that we inherited with all the life, all the animals, the variation okay. of life, and we are just wasting it. Time, thank you. I'd like to talk about China, essentially, and what is actually happening in China. Now, China has a planned economy, and it's not a capitalist country, but it's using capitalism in order to develop its economy, and that is a hybrid type of an economy. Now, they realize in China that they got a real problem there. There's a lot of people dying because of this global warming and all the pollution in the air. The scientists there and the professors are discussing this problem every day. And they had a plan under Marxism and under the development of communism the thing is to industrialize as fast as you possibly can to have a base for communism. So they have to have a highly developed economy in order to go forward. But they realize that things have changed. And this can no longer be done on that type of a basis. So there have been scientists there, and there's a scientist in the United States, plus the Marxists, his name is uh, John, Fo John Bellamy Foster, 
that went there, and a number of other scientists went there, and, pre and presented their viewpoint. Now, people walk around in China, they have to have masks and things like that. There's a tremendous amount of deaths. So either they change, or they're not going to be a viable country any longer, or we'll have a viable planet because the water is rising constantly and you go to the Marshall Islands, it's sinking. If you go to Florida, to Miami, and the other parts of southern Florida, it's sinking. The water is rising fast enough where they realize Florida won't be there in about 30 years. So. Um, this man, this Marxist, John Bellamy Foster, and a number of other scientists came up with what they call echo postmodern. They realized that they don't convert <laughs> solar power and uh, wind power and things that have nature, they'll never go forward. So they're arguing amongst all the scientists there. And it's not like here. The scientists and the professors get on television and they discuss that issue and they're discussing it in a very thorough way and they're using some of their previous philosophies of yin and yang and things like that in other words they have balance and so they're, they, they make more solar power than any of uh, the uh, other industrial uh, countries combined so they're now going forward, and they say in about 20 years, they'll, get, they'll reduce the pollution about 20%, which is a very But in the United idea. States, we have capitalism. And the main motor of capitalism is profit. And Obama, I don't believe what he says. He says a lot, and he professes a lot, but when it comes to doing things, he doesn't do it and he triangulates, he goes towards the Republicans and towards the people that support him. By the way, Obama, if you look it up in the internet, there's a program for education to, and it's all in testing. And he has a lot of uh, capital invested in that. And Obama has now become part of the 1% in the United States. Okay. Next. The polar vortex. Everybody talks about the polar vortex. It's a big thing that goes around the earth that brings the cold air down, right? No, it's not. The polar vortex <coughs> was discovered by NASA and geophysicists about 40 years ago. It's a, a stratospheric effect above the Arctic Circle, it does circle, but it has no effect on the uh, air beneath it. There's a large empty space between it. The uh, effect is, is negligible on, on it, but what it, does hap what it does is make a nice, easy uh, word for a <coughs> meteorologist on your 10 o'clock news to use, oh, we're going to be cold because of the polar vortex. Yeah. Nothing to do with it. The uh, like motion of the uh, wind beneath that, far beneath it, about six to seven miles beneath that, is what determines whether the, the wind will bring down and bring down the cold air. So the vortex is not our enemy, it's just a convenient phrase that is tossed around by meteorologists. Thanks, Dennis, for your presentation. Say, a, little, a little louder if you don't mind. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, I was just thanking Dennis for his presentation. <clears throat> and uh, my question, uh, as you'll recall, was about revolution. And uh, the way Dennis answered it, uh, he said something about demonstrations. Somebody else commented about uh, we need to think in new ways. Uh, Frank uh, was talking about uh, new ideas, uh, education. Uh, revolution is not about those things. Revolution is about power, the structure of power, the form of government. And uh, a, ra a, a real revolution would be a radical change in who has power in this country. Look at this last election.
Okay. So we had uh, another exercise in uh, musical chairs, <coughs> uh, pretty much. Now we have more bozo Republicans than we had before. And the Democrats are just slightly less bozo. Okay, that's the reality. Uh, people are now, and because the Democrats were disappointed, they're not talking about 2016. Okay, they were talking about 2012 a little while ago. They were talking about 2008 a little while ago. They were talking about 2000 a, year, a few years ago. I mean, this goes on and on and on and on after every goddamn election. How <laughs> oh, are we, fucking idiots? Okay, it's not going to change unless we change the structure of power, and that's what revolution is. We have a representative system in this country, and that is an out-and-out -out plutocracy. It's going to be a pluto it's a plutocracy now. It was a hundred years ago. It's going to be a plutocracy in a hundred years from now if we don't change it. And these plutocrats have one thing, in, uh, one goal, and that is, and they're psychopaths basically. They have one goal, and that is to accumulate wealth and power. And uh, they control the oil. They want more oil. The oil should sit in the ground. People, ordinary people, have more common sense than these psychopaths. So I'm not with Frank about how, you know, uh, the problem is people not having education or not, or being ignorant or blah, blah, blah. People have more common sense than these, these truly uh, mentally ill people that we have in power. Um, fracking is going on full speed here in Illinois. Just the other day it was passed. Did you all hear about that? No. Okay. Uh, you know, did, were we consulted? Was anybody in here consulted about fracking? What kind of goddamn democracy is that? It's a, it's a joke. It's a bad, bad joke. We are not a democracy in any way, shape, or form. Um, what else do I have to say? Okay, the U.S. and China. Can anybody seriously believe that these assholes are going to do anything about climate, about the climate? Uh, they, China has, so it has been making progress because they are not as, as quote as lunatic capitalists as we are. They're capitalists of another sort, but they're not quite as lunatic as we are. So they're making some progress with renewable energy. Okay, but they're also building uh, a, a, a coal a coal plant every friggin' week or two, and their population is such that if, if, if they start to consume the way Europe and the U.S. consume, we're, we're finished. They're already, China's already taking over, taking over large parts of Africa to cut down forests uh, and, to, and to build huge uh, uh, farms because they don't have enough land for their own. To, okay, this is, the trajectory that we're going on is like this, okay, in terms of destruction, in terms of uh, uh, carbon consumption, in terms of uh, uh, global warming, okay? It's, it's like this, okay? It's going up. We have to turn that around. We have to turn it, turn it the other way. And that's not going to happen with the, the kinds of governments that we have in the U.S. and in China. The U.S. Uh, sabotages every international agreement, every international summit, I should say. Do we expect anything different next time? Thank you. And I could go on a little bit, but that's about all I have to say for now. Well, in the best tradition yeah. of pre-prepared rebuttals at the college yeah. complex, yeah. I'd like to read a letter that I would have liked to read right last week if I had been here, yeah. which is actually a fine intro to the problems we're having to, uh, <coughs> talking about today. <laughs> what would be the more radical, more drastic change in late 20th century American society to fulfill the ten planks of the Communist Manifesto and <coughs> abolish them. First ask yourself how much they have been fulfilled already, in particular the central bank and the income tax. Now we have an answer to why banks never lose. Progressive Magazine, August 1988, and why neither Republicans nor Democrats nor even all the left-wing <coughs> champions of social justice attack banks, or at least we are well on the way. The answer, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, or at least we are well on the way. The answer actually lies over the edge of left-wing ideolo left ideological world and in the Hades of libertarian, hard money, <coughs> free market, free as in free election thinking, or better yet, rethinking. Without the Despite a control over capital sought by the central bank, 
and the income by the ten planks, in particular the central bank and the income tax. The left wing redistributive redistributive state would be impossible. A statement. Um, a standard course in economic course about two decades ago left yours truly with the nagging in question questions like why there had to be <coughs> inflation or unemployment, why there had to be war production to keep the economy working. Half a decade later, yours truly came across Harry Brown, how you can profit from the coming devaluation. <coughs> By then, on the lamb from an illegal war from his rest, having tried to get a federal judge out of his drank bank draft case for owning illegal bank stocks and making money off the war. Although Brown Predictions of $105 gold and $45, $3,500 Volkswagens are laughable now. This was 1988. You still are laughable now. <laughs> Even more so. Uh, he had. By his first opus and Brown's first opus, I considered an excellent first course in economics and an even more excellent umpteenth course. Somebody dropped the dollar here. <laughs> well, it wasn't mine. Somebody who flunked an economics course. <laughs> okay, Bill, your time's up, by the way. Or goes to the speaker. Anybody want to talk? A lot more to say about this. We'll tie it more into tonight's topic. But that's a big, uh, big question. Okay. Next week, probably. Okay. I'll start where I left off. The course. Mark's the onion. And brief ones, I'm sure. Hello? Is this on? No, we, we don't have the mic tonight, remember? Uh, no, I didn't. I mean, uh, how could I remember when I didn't know in the first place? No, we just, it just, it's just out it being looked at tonight. Okay, all right. About Al Gore, environmental swindler. In 1992, before Gore was inaugurated as vice president, he promised the people of Ohio that he, upon inauguration, would not allow an incinerator to be built in Ohio. No sooner did Gore take office than the incinerator was built. Thank you. Gore, somebody questioned whether or not Gore is an oil man? Gore is an oil man. Likewise, in 1992, Gore was and his family were heavy investors in Occidental Petroleum, which was very active in Colombia, still is today. And his president, Clinton, instituted Plan Colombia in 1999, what gave Colombia a billion dollars a year in military aid to quash rebels in Colombia. Gore no longer has the power of the office, then he gets out and puts on his environmental super cape and flies around in jet planes and drives around in SUVs to tell us little people about the problems of global warming. Is Al Gore an oil man? Yes, he is. Hey Tracy, I agree with you. You're right. Uh, 
Okay. Well, Mike, so I just... No, her name Mike. So uh, 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 I might. <laughs> Since Mike I've been right giving here. talks here for the last seven years or so, I coined a phrase back uh, probably 2005 <clears throat> to describe, you know, what... The question I have is what is... Uh, um, a TC opera, T I C I O P P E R. When somebody stands up at a, a microphone and says, The earth is flat, trust me, on any subject, he's either terrifyingly ignorant of the basic facts, certifiably insane, T I C I, or O P P, on a prostitution payroll. <laughs> <laughs> We're seeing some of the highest paid intellectual prostitutes on the planet telling us that there is no such thing as global warming, nuclear power is the greatest thing since sliced bread, uh, all kinds of stuff. Charles Ferguson uh, wrote the book called The Predator Nation. And in that book by Charles Ferguson, there's a whole chapter in that on the ivory tower. He said there's about a thousand professors nationwide that are positioned in universities to produce these kind of reports when the oil industry or the, uh, the banking industry needs a report uh, that says the earth is flat, trust us. And the, uh, a professor can get, they pour money in the university to produce the report and he can get $250,000 for one hour testimony before Congress. This is how the, the media will pick that up and trumpet it. So he got three people that say there's no such thing as global warming client change, and then 987 others on the other side, scientists all over the world. The science is very solid. And it isn't just climate science we're talking about. Uh, I have to say a word. On, uh, people have been uh, kind of unfair to Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> I mean, Rush Limbaugh, we, we have to give the man his due. Rush Limbaugh has, has skills. He's a certifiable genius in taking any kind of criminally insane bullshit and making it sound like common sense for the ordinary man. Rush Limbaugh is worth every penny of his $40 million a year that he gets. It costs about $2 a head. Rush motivates 20 million American people to rise up off their couches like zombies from the night of the living dead and go to the polls and vote for criminals masquerading as Republicans. This is what happened in the last election here. 39% of the people turned out to vote, but uh, the, 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 the zombies that listen to Rush, I mean, 80% of them get up off all the couch and vote. And this is how our system is voting in corporate criminals masquerading as Republicans. That's what we've got. Language matters. Frank, where's Frank? Is Frank still here? Oh, yeah. Frank is absolutely right. Talking about uh, the Don't fact. Accuse me of the same. <laughs> no, boy, I agree with Frank 100. percent That's why I say Frank. Frank nailed it. Frank uh, said, you know, basically the the, the, the term is 10,000 to one. The Earth takes in 10,000 and more much energy in sunlight per day than what we use. Ten, we collect one ten thousandth of the solar, daily solar intake. And we can run the whole planet with no coal, no oil, no gas, and no nukes, right? On February 14th, I'm going to give a talk here on uh, modern cults, cult-like beliefs that people uh, join uh, cults like, uh, you know, the cult of the people that are promoting thorium. You have to ignore massive amounts of reality to think that <laughs> any kind of nuclear power plant, big nukes, are going to be any kind of contribution toward solving the energy crisis. Well, in the time I have left, I'm going to read uh, a few books into the... For those of you that are going to watch this on the internet, there's uh, Elizabeth Colbert wrote a book called Field Notes from a Catastrophe, talking about the change, climate change that's upon us. Bill McKibben, uh, look up his name on the internet. He's one of the foremost speakers, uh, researchers, talking about global warming climate change. His book is called Earth, Making a Life on a Tough New Planet. That's Bill McKibben. Here's uh, James Hagen, H-O-G-G-A-N. James Hagen wrote a book called Climate Cover-Up. He describes the cover-up that exists in America, driven by the billionaires that own the media. Elizabeth Colbert wrote another book after that uh, field notes from a catastrophe. This one is called The Sixth Extinction. The Sixth Extinction. We're in the Sixth Extinction right now, 
and it's just um, a crapshoot of whether or not humanity is going to survive at all. Give me about 10 more seconds here. Naomi Klein's book is among my top 10 of all time. It's called This Changes Everything. It just came out, and it deals with the climate crisis is a way to solve our broken economic system. I highly recommend everybody get their own copy and keep it as a reference for the next few years. Lastly, uh, Ted was talking about an economic revolution. We need a revolution in thinking in our country. This is called The Economics of Revolution by David D. Graw. And it describes how our government has been lying to us for 40 years about a whole bunch of things relating to economics. So for those of you that want to understand what's happening in America, these two will go a long way toward helping you. This changes everything in the economics of revolution. Anybody wants any information on this or websites, come see me. I'll be in the back there. I have cards with websites on it where I get most of my information. Incidentally, oh, hey. the new, <laughs> thank you. And the new, the new Censor News book says if, if you want to be informed, stop watching the media and turn off Rush Limbaugh and the others and start logging on to actual news sites on the Internet. That's where the new, breaking news is without all the fluff. Thank you. Mike Lee. All right. You know, I almost wish this um, the battle cry wasn't climate change or global warming, yeah, it was global sustainability. Uh, that would be encom encompass more. All right, so I'm the guy that hates oil. I think oil is a lot worse than, than natural gas that heats his building and cooks your food and coal. Because we go to, we've been in a 20 year oil war variation now in the Middle East that's cost trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. So, anyway, since we didn't have too much uh, visuals, I printed out this from the EIA. So, America is using less and less coal. We're exporting more, which is bad. But we're using less. So I think wind power and solar and other technologies are changing the course on coal. But guess who the here's oil use in the world. Guess who has the biggest circle? Us. Yeah, us. So we use <clears throat> twice as much oil, which is basically transportation fuels. 75%. We use twice as much oil as Europe. Compared pot with equal population with equal GNP. So why is that? Because Europe has sustainable transportation systems, bullet trains and transit systems. Like Charlie and I promote the New York Chicago bullet train yeah. should be built, no question about it. China's done it, France has done it, Japan's done it, and a half a dozen other countries. And we should have better transit systems. We're sitting here worried about CTA and Metro all the time. It's crazy. Here's another visual. Here's how much we pay for gasoline. So down here is like two dollars, three dollars a gallon, and that's USA, right down here on that chart. And here's other more advanced countries. So in America, we'd rather have 17 trillion dollars in debt and pay that interest every month than tax oil properly to pay for these trillion dollar oil wars and maybe have the 1% kick in more. But we're paying China and all these goddamn banks interest rates for all that national debt. So, anyway, pick up one of these cards for New York Chicago Bullet Train with Charlie's website. Me on Facebook, New York dash Chicago Bullet Train is my Facebook site. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, we use 25% of the world's oil. Jet fuel is not taxed in this country. Figure that out. Jet fuel, by the way, is the worst greenhouse gas of all the oil fuels, all the transportation fuels. Uh, what else do I want to pollute your mind with? Poison your mind with. Um, that's about it. How many people know? Okay, here's uh, two more quick visuals. Here's the population of the United States, the major cities. So as you can see, you build a bullet train 
where the people are. <laughs> From New York to Chicago, that's where half the country lives. And I wanted to say more about our oil wars, but I think I've said enough. How many people know how many died in the Revolutionary War? 25,000. No, not even close. 675,000. That's Civil War. Yeah. No, no, no. Civil the American Revolution? Revolution? The American Revolutionary War. How many Americans died? 75,000. No, 75,000. Only no. 4 million in the country. How many did you say? 5,000. You're right. That's baloney. <laughs> How many died in the Civil War? 400,000. 500,000. 600. So 500. Okay. Anyway. Time's up. We're an oil war economy. That's one First, I, uh, I would like to uh, answer one of the early questions uh, asked by Mike Lee about, uh, is that your question about how much oil versus gas from fracking? What, what percentage is gas from fracking? <clears throat> yeah, it depends. Okay, basically, fracking can frack light oil and the gas. The oil Basically, the whole petroleum industry is a whole spectrum from gas, light oil, medium oil, heavy oil, tar sands. It's, a, it's continuous. So the fracking is, uh, is, uh, can produce lighter end of the, the material like gas and uh, uh, a little bit very light oil. And uh, right now in North Dakota, the geology was uh, uh, in that way, so it produces light oil and it makes a uh, lot of money there. And uh, for gas, it's uh, all over the country. So uh, it's uh, uh, most of the uh, those uh, thick shell, organic shell there produces gas. But only a few places like uh, North Dakota it produces light oil, which uh, is the, the hot, hot uh, area. Okay, uh, I would like to think how to solve this problem, like carbon tax, but I would prefer green tax, not just uh, uh, tax carbon dioxide generated to industry, but all the industry which uh, is basically an environmental tax. Because every way to produce energy has its drawback. So I think that's a much fair Thank you, Dan. Is the time up? No, no you got, you've, you've, got, uh, you've only gone two minutes and six seconds. Okay. You still have three minutes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, basically, my background is oil and gas industry. I'm a geologist. I went to Canada, uh, the oil province of Alberta, for 10 years. Over there, I looked at the oil sands particularly, and uh, which is the dirty part of the oil. I know many people, and my, I have very many friends in oil industry. Well, they are good friends. Uh, they are good people. They are working hard generating wealth. Uh, but now there's a, a problem. They are afraid of their, their, their salary but got cut, their job uh, got lost tomorrow. So I would prefer a gradual uh, carbon or green tax on those industry and uh, gradually uh, cutting down those industries so there will be say the the people can stay in that industry but the, the retired people won't be replaced and the, the industry will diminish eventually that's what I, I'm thinking the carbon tax uh, is uh, better than uh, a sudden revolution or sudden uh, uh, some uh, catastrophe for that industry. Uh, and uh, also I prefer uh, through the existing uh, system, like a democ democratic system, but uh, how to do that we can discuss uh, later uh, next week. Thank you very much.
of all, with regard, with regard to the comments that were made earlier about Al Gore. Uh, now, uh, I'm not necessarily Al Gore's biggest fan. But having said that, the problems that he pointed out are genuine. And they aren't going to go away simply because it's Al Gore who's pointing them out. And they aren't going to go away because Al Gore isn't a nice guy or because he's arrogant. <laughs> the problems are going to still be there regardless of whether it's Al Gore or somebody else who points them out. And he pointed them out in a particularly eloquent manner. And I think he deserves credit for that and not to be spat at by certain Tea Party people and by some of their fellow travelers, no matter what side of the fence that they're on. <laughs> Now, with regard to some of the other problems that Dennis pointed out, and Dennis, I want to thank you for coming in. You did give an eloquent presentation. You always do. Thanks. And it was quite a contract. You blew away some of the clouds of ignorance that David Ramsey Steele brought in here the last time he was here. Mr. Steele is an intelligent man and a nice man, but I am not an admirer of, of his political views. Do you want more iced tea? Sir? When he came here on an earlier session last summer, I asked him a question about British politics in the 1930s, and there was no doubt on the basis by which he answered my question that he's a conservative, plain and simple. Um, with regard to some of the problems that Dennis pointed out, I will say simply this. I've said this before, I'll say it again. The nuclear industry has never come up with an answer as to what to do about nuclear waste. And it's still piling up in various places. I don't know if it's still piling up in Yucca Mountain or whatever. It's still no, Yucca Mountain is closed. closed. That's one of the issues, again, well, the Republicans no doubt will attempt to revive Yucca Mountain in Nevada. That's for sure. They haven't said anything, but it's coming. It's still piling up. They also well, it's took piling up. It's spent storage pools around... Nothing's going to Yucca Mountain, but it's building up in the spent storage pools at the reactors around the country. And in addition to that, the nuclear industry is building most of the reactors in the United States. Maybe Frank can fill us in on another time about it. Took way too many shortcuts in the construction of this stuff. That's number two. Number three, we have the, the biggest example of that is the plant up at Zion. I remember when that went up when I was in high school. I was living on the North Shore in Evanston at that time. And Commonwealth Edison promised us that we were going to have all this cheap electricity as a result of what they were doing at Zion. Those of us who grew up during that era remember the TV commercials with that cartoon character that was a combined light bulb and bird. Little, little Bill! Little Bill. <laughs> Well, the bills ain't so little now, folks. And Zion turned out to have so many things wrong with it that it was cheaper to close it than to fix it. So it's closed, and I believe that they're in the process of decommissioning that plan. Yes, they are. Good. I think about it every time I take the train up to Kenosha for the Kenosha Streetcar Society. I can see it right out the window. Um, finally, when, uh, I attended when I was 16 years old. Uh, a teaching at Evanston Township High School on the first Earth Day in 1970. And we were addressed among, by, among other people, Dr. Roger Charlier, who was an ecologist at Northeastern at that time. And Dr. Charlier said the end of mankind would come not with an atomic explosion, not with a whimper, but with a gasp. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody's notes here. I feel like I'm in some kind of church here. <laughs> Before they defrag me. All right, let's thank our speaker. All right, I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Um, there were some questions there regarding fracking. Um, I've been doing the PR work for the frack people, but uh, if you want to know about it, the lecture that we had on it is at this website. The video is posted. It's one hour long. If anybody wants, I have a copy of Gasland, the documentary. Let's see me and I'll try and get that to you or Tim, maybe we can get it posted but, or duplicate it. 
but if you want to learn more about that, um, we go to this website and the lecture that is a full one hour lecture on every aspect of fracking uh, Laura gave here. Um, Ted says there was no involvement. There were in fact public hearings that were well attended. Uh, whether or not anything was accomplished through that process is another matter. They certainly uh, raised some attention here and they had a series of them regarding it. It was in fact a fairly controversial issue uh, even among the Greens in terms of their positions regarding it. I think it was the larger thing is some internal politics there. All right, that takes care of fracking. It's it's no good. Uh, let's. Oh, I'm going to tell you what's happening in fracking is it's going on in southern Illinois. And I talked earlier about these farmers down there, and they have got these mineral rights. And you know, this geologist, they they run and collect money, and they're fearful that regulations will come in and preclude them from collecting on these deals that they cut uh, with the oil boys, the oil companies. And so that's where the politics lies. And there's two divisions in this, and they're very fiercely opposed to the Greenies trying to come down there like telling them what to do. They, there's money to be made, and we environmentalists are precluding them from making it. And that's not what they want to hear. Okay, regarding Al Gore, I have a photograph of Al Gore and myself in my office. Figures. Because <laughs> 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 I was an early graduate and a certified lecturer of the Climate Reality Project. Uh, so I have a different view of it, I think, what they do. And I, they actually, I would recommend, uh, well, on the Greens, there's a, uh, a link to the Climate Reality Project. And there's all kinds of data and information on them. And much to their credit, they're pioneering. Uh, and I do give lectures from now and then. I'm called on to give lectures on this, so I don't know about it. Now, regarding, I'm going to switch again. Uh, you mentioned Lee. And let me tell you where that came from. Um, the, the whole green building stuff actually came out of sick building stuff. Oh. All right, and I did a, a publication for the government. It actually was when the internet was brand new on green building technology uh, that was available on resources and publications like books and the libraries and things like that uh, on uh, green building technology. I had very little interest in it at the time. They thought it was kind of like, kind of goofy, you know, freaky little fringe kind of thing. The last thing I've seen in an assembly of architects was <laughs> there was a waiting list to get this LEED certification. Uh, so I, uh, but it did come out of, I, I, I think it Thank really, you, really kicked in when the sick building syndrome you, was flying around for a few years and people uh, matter of fact, you can get LEED certification for interior. It's not just the whole building. Uh, we represent, and the government has an agency where they put in office space, and they try to put in LEED uh, interiors. They get credentials for that and make scores on it if it's using ecological products. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, the 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 thing about um, gas is this, uh, one thing that is really got to keep in mind, he had on it a little bit, this is crucially important, it's just not the CO2, but certain gases are really nefarious. Those are the ones you, you really got to stop. And in terms of global warming, it's like you were saying, you know, one was that. I'm trying to think of my last little point here. <laughs> 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 All right, time, Charlie. All right. All right. <laughs> later, I'll get up here. Okay, Brom, I can't. I you. have a need for global warming, and uh, thank God the landlord has 
finally provided a little of it. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Finally, you, you, did it. It. you have to bring the Lord, man. One second. One second. This is totally oh, not. Jesus. This nonsense about the American. Where'd you get that? That's totally nonsensical. <laughs> Five it's true. It's there are 5,000, there were 1,000 British soldiers killed in one battle. It's one battle, Bunker Hill. That's ridiculous. What do you think of that, my little friends? But they won the battle. 25,000. Not British. And they lost the Yeah. What do you think? They hit, what do you think? Three times as many Union soldiers died. That's baloney. 5,000? They lost 5,000 in a battle. You know, I, Charles, often, Charles, I have often thought what you guys are for instead of what you're against. You're against fracking. You're against oil consumption. You're against hydroelectric power. What are you for? To remove you from the position that you are in. Transportation. All right. Here's the thing. Jesus saves souls. We are going to need every bit of power we can because yeah. the link between development of human life and the providing of electric power has been well known for well over 100 years. And if we think right now that we're going to limit growth on some of these other developed countries, we got another thing coming. Right now, and it still is, coal is the cheapest way to get electric power and other things and you're going to have to change that economic. Right now, the future in most energy markets has been looking towards the development of natural gas and fracking and other more common fossil fuels. Now, the problem with renewables is that it's still only providing 1% to 2% of the power. Renewables are a widely dispersed energy source and have a good niche in them. I also agree with Dennis on a lot of the things that the present day nuclear power reactors have and what they are doing. However, when I've started taking a look at some of these Gen 4 reactors, particularly the thorium molten salt reactor, I found a real answer to climate change, to bringing power to the people and around the world. You want to know what you're board, talking I'm about. We told you already. Frank, I would appreciate you. Yeah, you would appreciate to keep giving us the same bullshit over and over. Frank, what I consider your stuff is just uninformed and crazy. Yeah, yeah. I've looked at the numbers. Well, we can challenge that in the court. Yeah, I've looked at the numbers, Frank, and I'm fully convinced of where I'm going. Yeah, you, I know what you're doing. You see, the thing is, you said, if you want power, look at what the nuclear industry has done in less than 40 years with the older types of reactors. They're providing over a third of the electric power in the world. Over yes, 400. it was very cold. <laughs> Over 400. I was freezing the whole night. Now, I understand it's dangerous. I understand there's radiation involved. But if you take a look, thorium, oh, this thorium thing I'm talking oh, about is not crazy. It's actually going to happen. Okay. If we don't do it, China will. They've got over 300 people and scientists right now headed up by the son of their former premier. They are so desperate to get a cheap source of power, better than coal, better than what they're doing now, that they're pumping a lot of natural resources into nuclear power, particularly into this molten salt thorium reactor design. Okay, um, I, I guess uh, a couple things. One, we don't know what to do with nuclear waste. That's very evident, and uh, we just keep generating more of it, and it's going to be here for millions of years. So we're just... It's, it's an insolvable problem at this point, and there's no uh, no real evidence that future technology is going to solve it. And thorium is uh, just as guilty of that as anything else. Uh, second is that uh, for those of you who ha uh, have not read it or have not uh, don't don't know about it. 
the book that Andy recommended by Naomi Klein about this changes everything is is excellent. We saw her speak. There is a website called thischangeseverything.org if you want to know more things about it. The uh, video of her talk that she gave downtown um, at the Drake Hotel, God help us, is um, on online. And if anybody uh, wants that website, they can come and talk to me afterwards. One of the points that she made is that when we use energy and we use resources to do our production, and this is one of the reasons that she identified capitalism as a huge problem, is that there are always people who pay that price. And it is always indigenous, poor people. In, in, in the case of this country, we uh, <coughs> mine for uranium on the lands of the Navajo and the Lakota Dakota Indians up in South Dakota, and we spread that radiation around, and it is it's causing and is the cause of, um, of of infant mortality and people getting cancer before they're supposed to, and all those other things. In the cases of just using resources to make our products. She cited an, an island in the South Pacific, oh, in Asia, uh, called Na Nauru, and I believe it's spelled N-A-I-R-U. This island was a, a source of, was colonized at, because it had a, a great source, and I believe it was sulfur. And they mined the island for sulfur and took out so much that they left a, a the only thing that's left of an island is a rim that the uh, population is living on. The population that had lived on the others had to be forced to immigrate to Australia, who is now the colonizer. And the people that are left are going to have to leave because of global warming and the rising sea levels. The island is good. What's left of the island is going to be under the, under the sea within about 20 years or so. So when we look at our use of uh, resources, we really have got to start to look at the real costs that people have to pay. And they are almost always the people who have no voice in how things are used and what are taken out. I used to, I still say it. The people who are taking the resources come in, they eat, they shit, and then they leave. They take the resources, they take them out, they leave the pollution, they leave the people poverty in poverty with no education for their children and no health care for the people. And then when it's, the resources are all gone, then they leave. And, and so the people who pay the price for our economic Progress are people in areas who don't have any, don't don't get any benefits from that process, and in fact are permanently and almost totally damaged because of that. We have to look at this cost. We absolutely have to look at this social cost. Okay, Brom, uh, do we have any other rebutters, or are you going to go now? Okay. Sit down, Brown. Dennis, before you go, um, I would like to say, okay, real quick, I would like to say thank you to the college tonight for keeping this debate on a very good intellectual level and not yeah. descend into what we have oh, done in the past. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but uh, we also got to applaud Charlie for all of his hard work to get the schedule up there, was it not, Charlie March? Yeah. So let's give Charlie a round of applause. Hey, for all of and let's thank Dennis again for giving a good presentation tonight.
you thanks, in. thanks for all your comments as always. It uh, gives me food for thought. I want to go through some of uh, David's one-liners when he was here. <coughs> he, I had a couple oldies but goodies from the coal industry. CO2 is not a pollutant. It is. Uh, 200, in the year 2007, the U.S. Supreme Court historically uh, 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 the, uh, um, the, said that it is a air pollutant, CO2, uh, ruled uh, in favor of that, and it is um, reg can be regulated under the Federal uh, Clean Air Act. Uh, CO2 is good for plants, of course. It's part of the carbon-oxygen cycle, but what we're doing is far beyond that. You're talking about out in the West, uh, California, the other western states, the, the wildfires that are going on, uh, destroying uh, vegetation. All of James Hansen's scenarios are wrong. He stopped with three, 350. That's with a 350 figure. We need to reduce to that level in the atmosphere. That's who came up with Dr. James Hansen, uh, one of the most famous, prominent climate scientists, now uh, retired from NASA. He had several possible scenarios. His mid-level scenario was correct. So David's wrong on that one as well. Uh, oh yeah, polar bears are thriving in a warmer climate. Well, polar bears are being forced to survive in a warmer climate. Their polar sea ice is melting, so therefore they have to uh, move inland, which causes uh, conflicts between uh, human settlements. Uh, because if they accidentally get into a garbage can or something, they start associating food with people. We have uh, we have problems uh, there. And as things continue, it's 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 uh, projected at some point if we don't do something about it that uh, polar bears will will basically go extinct, and uh, hopefully we can uh, we, we can we can stop that uh, from happening. I was correct about the uh, article from Scientific American. I dug it out in a hurry. It was March 18th of this year. The Dr. Michael Mann from Penn State University, another prominent uh, clim climatologist. Earth will cross the uh, climate, the danger threshold by 2036. I did remember the number correctly. And he says that if the world keeps burning fossil fuels at the current rate, it will cross a threshold into environmental ruin by uh, 2036, but we need to be working to uh, prevent that sort of thing. Frank, uh, thanks for your support and your comments. I agree with you that we should be fascinated with nature. I've taken a lot of hikes around in Chicago metropolitan area, along uh, uh, Lake Michigan, uh, the migratory uh, hot spots, uh, trips with my late mother to the Yucatan Peninsula, in Mexico, uh, trips to Florida, two to Alaska. Um, I, I agree, totally agree with Frank. Rocky Mountain Institute has come up. Uh, uh, Andy has talked about them. I've talked about them. They're the Think and Do tank in uh, Snowmass, Colorado. They're in the process of doing a report, uh, Reinventing Fire China. Now, they do have a Reinventing Fire book if you'd like to check out the uh, text for my presentation, that was on the recommended uh, reading list. And what they're talking about is great opportunities for energy efficiency and market-based solutions in China. China might be able to more than double its uh, 2030 target of 20% non-fossil fuel supply economically by 2050. And of course, uh, you know, we can't include nuclear power in that. Uh, there's different kinds of revolution. I, I'm glad that that topic was brought up. But you do have to be careful how you talk to uh, Jer uh, Mary and John Q. Public about that. Because you have to do something that's going to affect their lives and how they're going to live a better life. And we, as in terms of we need a radical change of who has the power, that's why we have to continue the, the people power pressure. Um, the ecological impact of the, on the world of China you folks are responsible for me keeping up with that. I've been asked that several times in the past, and my answers have been adequate. But uh, because of you, um, and now with the, the current uh, U.S.-China climate agreement, uh, that's something that we've uh, helped to take care of uh, this evening. There's a book at the Harold Washington Library Center by an environmental journalist called The Devouring Dragon. It's about uh, China's ecological impact on the world. He's traveled extensively through China, has done online research. 
And uh, the deforestation, I didn't talk about that much, but that is a big issue that I also work on. Yes, China is responsible for much of the deforestation in Indonesia and Malaysia. See, the Chinese live in concrete houses. And they go to a trade show and they see a wooden house. They've never seen one before. Then everybody wants to live in a wooden house. If you're not going to uh, cut down the timber in China, you go, you know, to Southeast Asia. So that's that's an issue that uh, we have to uh, to deal with. And I don't mean to be condescending. The book also said that the uh, Chinese eat anything that uh, crawls, walks, flies, swims, and, and that's another issue if you're looking at the illegal wildlife trade, like uh, rhinoceros horns and and that sort of thing. That needs to be uh, cracked down on. Um, Andy has an excellent book, A Climate Cover-Up. It's about climate politics. James Hogan is a co-author. He is in charge of a PR firm in Canada for a couple of years. Clients of his came to him asking about the climate issue, and he thought that the deniers and the layers had it right until he started digging, and he uncovers all the stuff that I'm talking about, all the disinformation, disinformation campaign, and, and all the, the all the stuff that uh, we we talked about tonight, I figured that Naomi Klein's book would come uh, would come up. It's really making a hit. It's making a splash, a sensation. I'm glad it makes people think. I haven't read the book. I've read a profile of her in Rolling Stone, and I've read a book review in the Progressive. And I think it's very good that she does raise the issues. But I'm not anti-capitalist per se. I agree with the unbridled runaway capitalism, but I support climate capitalism at least uh, for the term. You 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 got you got to you got to you know not just think backwards but think forwards. If you can have an economic system, how you're going to have people feed their families, buy things, make a living, um, that, that that's that sort of thing. But I think it is something that would be discussed. Uh, Charlie and I attended a, a session at the Harold Washington Library Center by Rainforest Action Network about uh, visualizing a post-carbon future. Now, I add post-nuclear to that, obviously. And one of the things that I pointed out was, it, it, you know, we're supposed to sit back and, and, and close your eyes and imagine what the world would be in 2050. It could be either good or hopefully bad, what your image is. It's regarding imaging and messaging and everything, and it is a good exercise, but I'm obviously not going to do it here, because I don't do those kind of presentations anyway, but it is still something good for people at least to consider. My point is, in the, in the year 2050, I said that we would have a steady state economic system. And a young lady in our small group goes, oh, that sounds like something from chemistry. No, it's social science. It's uh, uh, Herman Daly, one of the prominent uh, environmental economists. Steady state doesn't necessarily mean no growth. It means a dynamic system working within limits, which is neither capitalistic or socialistic. But I still think Naomi Klein's book um, does at least uh, serve to take a look. I appreciate the views of the geologists from the oil and gas industry. I really do. I agree that most of the fracking is for shale gas. I just am not sure about the exact percentage between shale oil and shale gas, but what he said concerning the shale oil deposits as opposed to the shale gas deposits, uh, that, that sounds uh, what, what, I've, uh, what, what, what I've come up with too. I support bullet trains as well. I've uh, done action alerts about um, high-speed rail here right. in the United States. Um, better transit systems, definitely. But the trouble is you got to deal with the nuts and bolts of a transit system. You want people to use a transit system, then you have all the, the ventricard horse crap that went on with all the glitches and everything. To be honest with you, I love my uh, Chicago card. I thought the Chicago card was great. They went to Ventra. I waited to the very last minute because I read Red Eye. And Red Eye covers the, you know, the transit stuff, the Ventra stuff like a blanket. It's the free daily if you get it here. And I waited to the very last minute to get my Ventra card to make sure that, uh, that most of the glitches were hopefully uh, out of it. Um, sorry, Tim. Energy efficiency is the least expensive energy source. You're talking about megawatts. Uh, 
in other words, saved uh, megawatts. Renewables provide at least 10% of our total primary energy, and they're growing faster than nuclear. We're not in the middle of a so-called nuclear renaissance, as the pro-nuclear cheerleaders claim. We're actually in a nuclear retreat because uh, the reactors are closing down for a variety of economic and technical reasons. Yeah. Last count, we, we were at 99 reactors, and as far as I'm concerned, you can just keep closing them down and closing them down to zero. Um, I've looked at the evidence about thorium, Tim, and you know this, I included, you know, including super fuel. Right. I looked at it right and left, backwards mm -hmm. and forwards. Last summer it was almost a full-time job for four months. Wow. And I'm sorry, I conclude, Tim, completely okay. opposite of you, there's just another commercial nuclear power boondoggle. Okay. The, the proliferation will still be a serious problem with thorium, and that's something that you and John totally ignore among uh, the mining waste, um, the waste at the back end of the fuel cycle, and also the higher cost. Again, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for uh, coming out. Oh, one more thing. I just want to make sure that the, that the, the downstate group filed the lawsuit I said on Monday because of deficiencies in the rulemaking process. They want to halt uh, Illinois' new inadequate fracking rules, so hopefully we can get that done. Thanks a lot, everybody. And contact the U.S. Contact the US Senators and tell them uh, say no to Keystone XL because the vote's on Tuesday. Yeah, because that'll listen to us. Tell us out, Brom. Giving us a lot to think about. One dollar, one vote. Yeah. I need your email address.